these nicotine receptors. Receptors just mean sort of like a key going inside the keyhole. And this is nicotine binding to the receptor. They're called alpha 2, beta 4. Or, yeah, alpha 4, beta 2, rather. And it binds to the receptor. And then what happens is neurotransmitters go down the neuron along this path. And down here at this end in the mesolimbic system, dopamine and other neurotransmitters are re released. And again, the whole point of this is to show you that there's an elaborate system in the brain that's very active every time someone takes a hit of gutka or DD or anything. Now, very simple pharmacology, just so you know the term coatinine. This is nicotine. It's a chemical, obviously. It's found natural in the tobacco leaf. And this is coatinine down here. Coatinine is the breakdown product of nicotine, so it's metabolized to coatinine. When you do, when we check like saliva or urine or blood, we're generally measuring coatinine, not nicotine. Uh, does anyone know why? Reason we check coatinine is because coatinine has a longer half-life. Nicotine has a very short half-life, so it's hard to measure it because it gets metabolized very quickly. Coatinine has a half-life of 24 hours, so it's quite stable, so you can measure it at any point in time. So you can measure it. You can detect it in urine. Saliva, blood, you can detect it in hair, you can detect it in fingernails, and I think that's it. Fingernails, hair, yeah. So it's it's quite 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 a number of ways that you can measure it. So this is just a graph showing a surveillance data in the United States because you know the U.S. has has quite a bit of uh, strong surveillance data uh, for many years, and you can see by race. African Americans have had very high rates of smoking back in 1965, up to 65%. It has gone down. So for every group, the smoking rates have, have gone down. So if you think about the phases of tobacco, I don't know if you're familiar with that term, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. The U.S. is obviously very far along where the, the rates of tobacco use have gone down quite dramatically over the past 45, 50 years. But historically, again, African American men, the highest, white men the second highest, and African-American women and white women about the same. But the declines have been pretty rapid. As you can see, more rapid for men than they have been for women. Another, I'm going to show different ways of slicing the data. And as you look at this, you should also be thinking about your own studies and how you might want to slice the data. Question? Yeah, so someone asked a question, is the analysis in research uh, when you assess coatinine in the human body, not nicotine. So I'm, I'm guessing the question is saying, when you validate, someone says, I'm not smoking, and you check their urine, what are you checking it for? You're checking it for coatinine. You don't check it for nicotine, again, because of the half-life. Coatinine has a more stable half-life, so that's how you measure it. As you know, you can also measure, my voice is breaking again. Uh, you can also measure it with carbon monoxide, which uh, measures a puff. The problem with carbon monoxide is it only measures people who smoke tobacco, not people who use uh, smokeless tobacco. So here's some data showing by race. Again, this is American Indians, not Indian Indians. <laughs> These are the native Indians of the United States. They have had historically very high rates of smoking, and this is relatively recent data, and unfortunately, they continue to have the highest rates of smoking, the highest rates of alcoholism, some of the highest rates of depression. It's a very vulnerable group in the United States. Very sad, actually. Uh, whites have a rates of smoking about 22%. And African Americans actually finally went under whites in terms of being a little bit lower rate. They're about 21%. Latinos or Hispanics, people of uh, South America and Mexican origin, about 16%. And interesting enough, Asian Americans, about 10%. Now, Asian Americans in, in, in the United States generally means Chinese, Japanese, and India, Indians. Uh, there are other groups as well now, more recently, Vietnamese uh, and uh, South Koreans, and, and others, of course. Uh, I will tell you, though, that the rates of smoking for 10% are driven by the low rates of smoking in Japanese and to some extent, Indians who have lived in the U.S. for a long time. Vietnamese men, for example, in Vietnam have rates of smoking about 60, 70%. It's very high. Yeah. 
Ah, our friend here just asked, do we have data on number of cigarettes smoked by each group? He asks, and we deliver. Uh, this is the next slide, which shows number of cigarettes per day by each group. <laughs> so this is data that's a little bit old, but here it is, uh, the question you just asked. So for non-Hispanic whites, or whites, Caucasian, its average now in the U.S. is 18 cigarettes a day, which is slightly less than one package of cigarettes. For blacks, it's 13 cigarettes a day. So this is nanograms per mil. Men and women are the same, about 122. Okay. Now whites have 143 nanograms per mil. Blacks have higher nanograms per mil. And look at Mexican Americans, very low. Now this is not per cigarette smoke. This is on average. So it's, it's useful data. It's not the most useful data. But one thing you should be able to tell right away is remember, blacks smoke 50%, 40%, 30%, less cigarettes per day, 40%, less, less cigarettes per day. But yet their cotinine levels are much higher than whites. Right? You can see it. Now, where has this data reduced in 2000? So the question is, oh, you can see it, everyone here. Uh, has the data re changed, I assume, is the question since 2012. Um, so in the United States, generally for the past five years, the prevalence rates have remained pretty much the same. You know, so if it was 23% five years ago, it's maybe 22.5%. So in the United States, we've enjoyed that dramatic decline I showed you over the last 50 years, but essentially it has plateaued for the last five years. We sort of hit a bump. We can't seem to get the prevalence rate much lower. But, but, but I think I'm going to show you some more data what has happened. So while the prevalence rate is lower, I'll go ahead and tell you, the number of cigarettes per day has continues to go down. Right? So the prevalence, the number of people who even have one cigarette, is the same, but the amount the average smoker smokes is much less. So the exposure to carcinogens and harmful effects is much lower. And therefore, we continue to see in the United States continued decline of lung cancer prevalence and lung cancer mortality. Quite dramatic, actually. See, in other countries, like India, Japan, and so on and so forth, lung cancer mortality, and, and in, in the United, and in India, oral cancer mortality continues to go up. You're in that earlier phase, remember phase two? You're in phase two, I think, right? Yeah, so phase two means your disease rates are going to continue to skyrocket, unfortunately. Yeah, 20, 30 years, at least, at least. Even if you begin to enjoy, enjoy a flattening of the prevalence, remember there's a delayed effect of disease. Yeah, exactly, 20 to 30 years. So this shows now, uh, another way of looking at it is that intermittent here means non-daily smokers. This is a very interesting group that we're actually doing quite a bit of work on now, in the last uh, one year actually. The people who don't use tobacco every day. This is someone who smokes 1 to 10 cigarettes a day, 11 to 19 cigarettes a day, and a pack of cigarettes or more a day. And here in the intermittent category, you can see that the intermittent smokers, uh, in terms of what percent of that group is intermittent, you can see Asians are 30%. Latinos, one out of three Latinos who uses cigarettes is an intermittent smoker. For blacks, one out of four blacks who smoke tobacco are intermittent smokers. And then here, whites, it's much less. So you can see that whites are heavier smokers by looking at this and also by looking at this graph. This is more dramatic. Pack a day, almost half of whites smoke a pack a day. So they're heavy smokers. Now again, I'm going to show you some very intriguing data. I'm just building the case for what I'm about to show you. And you can see blacks are not heavy smokers. Blacks tend to be light smokers compared to whites over here, 1 to 10 cigarettes a day. Are you with me? Question. Uh, average cotinine content for those who are exposed to secondhand smoke. Ooh, good question. So the question is, um, well, first, I think the broader question is, can you measure cotinine in secondhand smoke? In other words, if you, um, if you, if you, if you, if in someone who's exposed to cigarettes but is not a smoker, can you measure cotinine in their urine? You know the answer. The answer is yes. And I'm going I'm to I'm 
hold on answering this question entirely because I have a very interesting study, if I ever get to it, uh, that we're doing right now where we're, I mean, the best way to answer that is measure the urine of children ages 0 to 5 who live in households where they smoke. So we're doing that. And in 99% of those kids, we found measurable cotiny. And actually, we also found in 99% of those kids, ages 0 to 5, we found NNAL. That's a carcinogen. It is the most potent carcinogen there is literally on the face of the earth. It was found in these babies. And at levels that were astronomically high. This is sort of the new face of tobacco research that we're sort of looking at in the next year or two. Oh, that, sorry, in the past year or two. And Steve Hecht, who's a biochemist at Minnesota, is sort of the lead carcinogen expert. And Neil Benowitz, the guy I showed you from San Francisco, is one of our collaborators in this work. So um, the answer is you can find it. I think the second part of the question is what are the levels? Um, I'm going to guess a little bit because I don't do that much work in levels in secondhand smoke of cotinine. But the point is they're detectable. So they're in the range of 10 to 40 nanograms per mil. So they're, they're actually measurable. And of course, the more you're exposed to it, the more levels you will have in your blood or in your urine. Oh, it's a cartoon. Um, so now there's someone who has a problem. He asked for a cigarette, not water. So the, the joke is supposed to be that the guy's in the middle of a desert, and he's asking for a cigarette. He doesn't even care about water, even though he's completely dehydrated. Um, you know, again, highlighting the addiction of, uh, of cigarettes. So this is what we knew about African-American um, smokers years back when I started to do my research. Uh, and no one was doing work in this area. We knew they started smoking later. So whites, on average, started smoking at ages 10, 11, 12. And blacks were starting at ages 12, 13, 14. We know they smoke fewer, than fewer cigarettes per day. I showed you that. We haven't talked about this, but they're more likely to smoke menthol cigarettes. Do you know what menthol, do they have menthol cigarettes in India? Menthol? Yeah, but it's specifically menthol. That'd be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so let me just tell you what menthol is. Menthol is naturally found. You know what menthol is, actually. It's a mint. It's actually a mint. It's a mint plant. So they take menthol, and they actually artificially add it to cigarettes. And they started doing it back in the 1960s, I'm guessing. And it was done to market a very cool cigarette. Cool, C-O-O-L, meaning cool as in you look cool, but also cool as in refreshing. So when you think about a mint, peppermint, spearmint, you think about refreshing and cool. Um, and so it was essentially a marketing strategy of the tobacco industry to get a segment of the population to start smoking menthol cigarettes. That segment was black. And they were very successful. So that's so much so that 80% of blacks in the United States smoke menthol cigarettes. And to give you the analogy, only 20% of whites smoke menthol cigarettes. It's marketing. It was marketing. Now, they will tell you that they can taste the difference. And there's been all these different hypotheses. So menthol is also felt to be a topical anesthetic. So if you think about cough drops, maybe not homeopathic cough drops, but Hall's cough drops, you know what's in there? It's menthol. It even says it, mentholated. It'll say mentholated or mentholated eucalyptus cough drops. And the idea is that menthol decreases the cough reflex. So you can imagine if that's really true and someone smokes menthol cigarettes, it decreases their cough reflex. And your cough reflex is your first line of defense against bad things, you know, uh, particulate matter and things like that. Here you have someone smoking a cigarette that numbs the back of their throat and theoretically allows them to inhale deeper and theor theoretically allows them to get more sort of the bad elements inside their body. I say theoretically because the research, unfortunately, has not proven this, this to be the case. It's a very controversial uh, issue. Lots of questions. Uh, the way a smoker craves for a cigarette, can a secondhand smoker develop the same craving just because of exposure? Well, that's a good question. Um, so there's very little, that's a good, very good question, actually, because there's very little work in that area. That is that if someone smokes, can a child who's 10, 15, 20 years old, whoever is, who's living in that house, somehow get enough cotinine, and, well, that's interesting, enough nicotine, it's not cotinine that's addictive, it's nicotine, enough nicotine transmitted uh, through secondhand smoke that they themselves would get craving. I'm going to admit ignorance. I don't think there's any data on that. 
Um, my gut response is you would have to get very heavy exposure, um, that, such that in a in, in a bar, like in a bar where the smoking levels are very high. Um, are, can you smoke in a bar in Delhi? Oh, it did smoke free. The bar is also. Theoretically, yeah, no, <laughs> enforcement is the second issue. Yeah, okay, but so uh, my answer is going to be I don't know. I think there's almost no literature, but my gut response would be the answer is uh, no. Any other question? There were some more questions. Does menthol have any synergistic effect? Oh, good God, who are these people? These are great questions. Uh, does menthol have any synergistic effect with carcinogens in tobacco? So again, we don't have the answer to that. So far, the work is suggesting no. Neil Benowitz, the guy in San Francisco, the pharmacologist, cardiologist, is very interested in that question. Um, but again, all the data so far is suggesting uh, does not seem to potentiate the effect of carcinogens. It does not seem to have any effect uh, sort of with carcinogens. Never going to get done. Uh, try to quit smoking more often. So they try more often, but they relapse more often. So they're not succeeding. And very interestingly, and I'm going to show you some pretty shocking data, they have significantly greater tobacco attributable morbidity and mortality in cardiovascular and in cancer. So again, another way to look at this issue about uh, racial ethnic differences in nicotine intake, this is nicotine intake per cigarette. So if you have one cigarette, what, be, what will be your millig and the cigarettes are all the same. So everyone gets the same cigarette, Marlboro, Light, or whatever. And they smoke that whole cigarette the same way, theoretically. The whites will have a nicotine. Will will take in 1.1 milligrams of nicotine. The Hispanics will take 1.05 milligrams of nicotine. The African Americans will take 1.41 milligrams of nicotine. So quite a bit higher, right? 40% higher. And the Chinese Americans studied in this group will actually take in much less nicotine. Well, let me read this to you. Neil Benowitz wrote an editorial. I published a paper in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, in 2002, and Neil wrote the editorial. And he said, the editorial that went with my paper, he said, smoking cessation interventions may yield different results in smokers of racial and ethnic minority groups or of lower economic backgrounds. The genetic, sociocultural, and pharmacological determinants of addictive smoking may differ by racial and ethnic groups or economic status. So it's not all biology. He's saying it's also socioeconomic status and other issues. He goes on to say sufficient information and perhaps the necessary research tools are lacking to deconstruct racial and ethnic differences into genetic versus sociocultural versus pharmacological influences and their interactions. Until these are available, application of specific interventions should be examined empirically, which means you need to study it, rather than just assume It'll be similar across different racial and ethnic groups. In other words, if Chantex works in the US, he's saying, and I agree with him, is you shouldn't just assume that Chantex would work in India necessarily. You shouldn't work, assume that Chantex would necessarily work the same in people living in um, the, uh, it's called restricted settlement? I forgot the term. Uh, not JJ, but the resettlement, sorry, res resettlement groups. So you know, people will do different things. It's not just about the biology that the, the people in the settl resettlement areas have different genetic profile and they'll metabolize it, metabolize it necessarily differently. It's things as simple as adherence. They may not take the medicine. They may forget to take the medicine. If they have to buy the medicine, they can never afford the medicine. So there are many issues that he says that are important to study. Okay, now watch these series of slides. This is where I think it gets so this is all um, literally hot off the press. This is in the last year or two. And this is all Neil Benowitz's work, looking at essentially black-white issues. So let's look at this first slide. So this is blacks versus whites, cigarettes per day versus cotinine per cigarette. So you just have to think about this for a second, so I'm going to walk you through it. So this is if you smoke 0 to 9 cigarettes a day, 10 to 14, 15 to 19, a pack a day, and greater than 25 cigarettes a day, OK? Now, obviously, if you smoke more cigarettes, and this side of the graph was plasma cotinine, this curve would go up, right? The more you smoke, the more your cotinine. But this is adjusting for cigarettes per day. So you need to take that cotinine, where my pointer is, 
and then divide by 25 cigarettes a day, right? So it's adjusting. So this graph is plasma cotinine per cigarette per day. You just have to think about that for a second. But this is really fascinating. When you are a heavier smoker, you extract less nicotine than measured as cotinine. You get less cotinine per cigarette. As you smoke a little less, you get more efficient either genetically or uh, phenotypically, in other words, how you smoke it. As you smoke even less, maybe here. But essentially, these are about the same rates. But look what happens here. As you smoke very few cigarettes, three cigarettes a day, five cigarettes a day, even one cigarette a day, for whites, right here, it's about the same. But look what happens to blacks. <laughs> the work that we're interested in, the light smokers, I call them light, meaning they smoke less than 10 cigarettes a day. Their extraction is 40 nanograms. I'm not sure what the, the, the measure is, but 40, 40 units per cigarette per day. Speaking too fast? Speaking too fast. Okay. It's about 40 cigarettes, 40 units per cigarette per day. Does that make sense? So they are getting more nicotine, more cotinine per cigarette. So if you're white, you get 15 per cigarette. If you're black, you get triple. So remember, the biggest addictive substance is nicotine. So then you should be able to conclude that blacks theoretically should get addicted to cigarettes and tobacco use at a much lower level of use. And that could explain one of the reasons to explain why blacks smoke less cigarettes per day. So we're using cigarettes as a form of tobacco of interest. Now watch what happens to carcinogens. OK, so remember I told you about carcinogen? I told you about NNAL. There are other carcinogens. Neil is also interested in what's called 1-hydroxypyrene. Pyrene you can recognize as a benzene. So it's an aromatic hydrocarbon. Uh, sorry, it's a PAH, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. So 1-hydroxypyrene uh, per cigarette per day. So same issue, 0 to 9, 10 to 14, and so on and so forth. You follow me. And this is even more linear. Look at this. Blacks and whites are the same until you get to the low, low level. Same thing all over again. I don't know what the oh the units are actually just uh, the division right uh, this divided by this so it's 0.15 for this and again 0.45 so triple the level of carcinogen per cigarette smoke for blacks compared to whites now watch as the story progresses now look what happens this was published in 2006 in New England Journal of Medicine by a different group this is actually data out of Hawaii Japan I think oh, sorry. Hawaii and mainland United States. I don't know if you can see it here, but I think you can. Let's just say, so this is men who smoke 10 cigarettes a day. This is women who smoke 10 cigarettes a day. So someone asked, are these differences due to genetics? Uh, a good question, again. Uh, in part, yes. I think that's fair. Uh, I would say that it doesn't explain the whole thing, and this is the line of research that Neil and others are pursuing which is looking, I'm going to tell you about a geneticist that we work with, uh, Rachel Tyndale, who's actually really the genetics person. It's not Neil. But it's also related to phenotype and also metabolism. It's also related to how you might smoke the cigarette. In the lab setting, you can make everyone smoke the same cigarette. You can make everyone smoke the same way. In the real world, people smoke however they want to smoke. A poor person is going to smoke that cigarette till they almost burn their finger because they want to use up the tobacco. A rich person smoking Dunhill, <laughs> you know Dunhill, a uh, very expensive brand, they'll smoke a few puffs, put it down, smoke a few puffs. They're smoking it very differently. Okay, let's look at African Americans. And this on the left axis, I'll, I'll come to the question in a second. This is uh, rate of lung cancer per 100,000 population left axis. So basically, it's cancer rate. This basically on the x axis is age. Obviously, as you get older, you get more cancer. That's true of any cancer except childhood cancer. So as you get older, you get more cancer. Look at the rates of cancer for African Americans compared to, you know, it's hard to see the groups, but basically any other group, it's higher. And then Japanese and Latinos have the lowest. OK? And you can see there's a big gap. And the gap is quadruple, right? This is not mortality. It's rate, right? It's the rate. So it's incidence. It's quadruple incidence. And this is for women who smoke 10 cigarettes. We see it true across gender. The gap is a little more narrow. 
what, watch what happens when you smoke more than 30 cigarettes. The gap is even more narrow, right? Just think about that just for a second. The gap is narrower when you smoke more. The gap is wider when you smoke less. It should make complete sense to you. I just showed you in those previous slides, remember? The lower level smokers, this side, had triple the carcinogen than the heavier smokers. So if you're getting triple the carcinogens when you're black and not white, when you're a low smoker, you're essentially behaving as a heavier smoker. The black smoker, who's a very light smoker, is really behaving as a heavier smoker, right? So if they have five cigarettes a day times 45 units, they're getting 225 units. The white smoker, to get 225 units, remember they're at 15 units on the x-axis? They have to smoke 15 cigarettes. 15 times 15 is 225, right? They have to smoke much more. And this has turned out, this has turned out to be true even in the clinical trials we've done. And then I think the last part of the story, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Here are the questions. Yeah. So the question is, could it be related to pulmonary capacity, vital capacity, you know, of all those pulmonary function tests? It's possible. It's possible. There are, by the way, racial differences in PFTs. Like, for example, I think even Indians and, and Caucasians. So, so I think that's some of it. Yeah, I think the problem is there are many variables. Yes, 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 yes. Although, remember, I once showed you a gender slide about 10, 15 slides ago, and it was about the same. So it appears that even women who are going to have lower vital capacity and all these different things, it appears they still seem to be adjusted for race and all that and age. They seem to be getting the same amount. So I, so I think in answer to your question, it, it's possible, but I think but it's maybe not so likely. The question is, is this difference purely because light smokers smoke for a longer time and heavier smokers just smoke it for a shorter while since they could keep on smoking throughout the day? Yeah, I mean, I think that's possibly part of it, that somehow the lighter smokers are, are just more efficient at extracting it are smoking more of that cigarette. Um, and also, again, it could be related to genetics and kinetics. Are there more questions that are hidden in there? Too? Due to menthol, is there any secondhand smoking illness will arise? Menthol, secondhand smoking. I, I'm not trying to understand the question. I, there, there's nothing that we know of about, men, I guess, the, there, there's, no, there's nothing that we know about menthol and secondhand smoke. I would answer it that way. Any available data for Indian scenario and races, how much it varies with other races? Yeah. No, that's uh, no. There's not. Um, Asian Indians, Indian subcontinent, has is not a big enough group yet in the United States. And actually, interestingly enough, it's sort of a new push of mine in the U.S. It's actually an understudied group in in the U.S. No one's studying Asian Indians. Even Asian Indians like me are not studying Asian Indians. So no one's doing it. There are a couple of people that are starting to do it. We're very interested, especially in diabetes. The diabetes is epidemic in in, in well in the U.S. and in India. And uh, cardiovascular disease, I keep hearing stories about 40-year-old Indian men getting heart attacks, 35 we talked about yesterday, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, there's really no data, and I doubt there's data here in India. Let me move on. This is now uh, the final slide of this whole story. Less than 10 cigarettes a day, 11 to 20, 20 to 30, 31. Now these are going to be, I think, odds ratios. So you have to remember your statistics just a little bit. So African Americans will be, will be the refer, referent group. That's obviously a ratio of 1.0. Native Hawaiians have, so for any given level of smoking, so this is now the less than 10 cigarettes a day. Hawaiians, like in the country of Hawaii, it's not statistic, statistically significant, but the odds ratio is 0.88. Latinos, 0.21. So one-fifth of the rate of lung cancer. Is this lung cancer? Yeah, lung cancer compared to blacks when they're light smokers. Japanese, one-fourth, 0.25. Whites, one-half at 0.45. So for every given level of smoking, the referent group, you will see all these numbers are lower than one. Every odds ratio is lower than one. Bottom line, blacks are screwed, big time. They will always get more cancer for unit level smoking. Only until you get very heavy levels of smoking, one and a half packs a day, does the odds ratio begin to approach that. This all matches the data I showed you, remember, about carcinogen and lower levels. So it's a very nice story about research that's 
incremental research that takes you know 10 years that you build on to itself. So now we know a little bit more. We know blacks have higher lung cancer risk, higher levels of nicotine dependence, slower metabolism of nicotine and cotinine, greater nicotine and smoke intake per cigarette, possible impaired, there's another issue about cancer, possible impaired detoxification of tobacco-specific nitrosamines, and possible role of menthol in addiction and metabolic alterations. I haven't showed you that per se. I'm going to have to move much faster, much faster. So I'm going to skip a couple slides then. Uh, was that making sense so far? Okay, so now I'm going to move to my research. That Most of that was sort of research related to my research, not directly related, or sorry, not directly my research. So I started doing my first project in 1993, and I show you this slide, and I give this talk quite a bit throughout the U.S., uh, because I want you to uh, to remain encouraged and inspired what is possible to do here in India and the work that you're doing, and that everything starts from very humble beginnings. So my first project, I finished my fellowship, I was a doctor, MD, I got my two master's degrees, I moved to Atlanta in 1992, I go to my office desk and I just stare at the computer screen and I said, I mean, literally, this is what happens. You're a new assistant professor. I guess it's time to start doing some research. <laughs> and, you know, you have to come up with a question. And so I was, you know, this hospital I worked at called Grady Hospital in Atlanta, very large hospital. I mean, uh, obviously not as large as some of your hospitals, but it saw almost one million outpatient visits a year. I mean, that's pretty big, actually. I mean, that's sort of at the level of AIMS and that kind of thing. A thousand beds, big outpatient clinic, big OPD, as you call it. So I was just... And about 85% of the patients were African Americans were blacks. I just was amazed at when we did services on the inpatient attending. People seemed to be in the hospital like that squirrel. They were in the hospital because if you looked at them and the disease they had, it wasn't TB or malaria, by the way. This is the U.S. It was because alcohol, tobacco, poor diet, and poor activity. So it was cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, which is not a disease per se, but metabolic syndrome, hypertension, that's what they're in. Um, and I said, okay, I'm interested in smoking, so that's what I'm going to do. So I did a study, uh, sort of like uh, Dr. Sarkar's study in the census survey, where you go out and you ask five questions. Your name, your good name, your age, your gender, do you use tobacco, if so, which tobacco? That's the study. And we talked yesterday that we can get a paper out of that. So my first study was I asked like six questions of people in the walk-in clinic. It's like a smaller, uh, not serious emergency room, but sort of people with problems that are less serious. Do you smoke? If you smoke, are you in, yeah. If you smoke, do you want to quit? And then are you, would you, uh, let's see, do you smoke? Do you want to quit? Would you be interested in participating in a study? Actually, it's the same as your study. Exactly. And then we had some numbers. Their smoking rates were very high, 45%. In spite of the national data with blacks were smoking about, at that time, 30%, it was very high because this was a very poor population. And the answer was basically yes, yes, yes. And no one was studying them. So I said, all right, this is going to be my thing. So I did, I mean, that's really what happened. So I started a study in 1995 where I got some money from Marion Merrill Dow, a pharmaceutical company, and some foundation money, and I want to study uh, blacks using uh, the nicotine patch. So it was simply a double-blind placebo-controlled trial to evaluate the efficacy of the patch as an adjunct to counseling and education for smoking cessation. Adjunct means that both groups, the intervention group and the control group in the randomized trial, got the counseling and education, but the intervention group got the nicotine patch and the control group got the placebo patch. We were smoke looking at, back then people would only study heavier smokers. Everyone only studied heavy smokers. Heavy, by the way, in the U.S. means more than 10 cigarettes a day because people are smoking less than they used to. And we basically screened 833 people. 586 were eligible for the study. And we randomized 205 into each group. And very simply, we had our results at 10 weeks. 21% quit smoking in the nicotine patch group and 13% in the placebo patch group. The p-value is 0.03. And then you follow them up to six months, 17% compared to 12%. And we actually lost statistical significance, but the trend was there. 
and uh, the adjusted p-value is not significant. But that was my first sort of big study. You know, you have to have a start somewhere. I published it. I got one or two papers out of it, and that sort of really started uh, uh, my career. Um, and uh, and uh, Bidwit, this is where you'll see the themes we're talking about, the feasibility. Uh, so you have to have a track record to get the bigger money. I showed that recruitment with blacks was successful. No one had done this. I mean, no one was doing, everyone works with whites in the US in the early 90s. No one was doing with blacks. Um, retention was acceptable. Well, I was able to keep them in the study, 60 to 70%. People didn't believe black smokers were interested in quitting, by the way. They said, oh, they don't want to quit. They're poor. It was very uh, insulting in a way, very patronizing. They said that. So African Americans were interested in quitting. They were interested in participating in research, and they were able to quit. However, the quit rates were lower than other clinical trials that largely featured white smokers. What were those reasons? We don't know. You're seeing as the video stopped. Is it? Okay. Um, so is it socioeconomic status? We enrolled lower socioeconomic status smokers in other studies. Was it ethnicity itself? Somehow being black made you have lower quit rates? Somehow, could it be a marker for menthol smoking? Could it be a marker for genetics? We then went on to our next study, 